So, the next we as we said in the last class that we have done the mass, we have done the momentum, now we are going to do the energy equation, right. Okay, so, energy balance, balance um, at the interface q l double prime minus q v double prime dot n relative plus square by 2 minus L. Okay, where in this particular form where work done by surface tension ST and disjoining pressure. pressure is neglected okay. and uh, the velocity of the reference frame is taken as the interfacial velocity V i right. Velocity of reference frame, frame is taken as the interfacial velocity velocity v i. Okay. So, now this can be further written in this particular form k v. So, this is basically we are using the Fourier's law of heat conduction right to replace the q uh, this and this right the, the two flux terms. this you have already seen earlier. Okay. So, this equation can be further written in terms of the enthalpy, let us go to the next one. So, in terms of enthalpy this becomes, these are basically long equations. So, uh, just takes the enthalpy that is the definition for enthalpy right. Okay. Now, based on this you can write K v is basically nothing but the Fourier's law of heat conduction terms that we have written over here. Okay. The long equations this is the corresponding work done by the stresses. equal to m h l v that is a latent heat component p v rho v minus p l rho l plus half b v square v i plus half v l square plus v l into Okay. So, this is basically the latent heat of vaporization. Right. Okay. Similarly, likewise we told earlier that the stress tensor is already uh, predefined right P i plus 2 mu d minus 2 third mu. Okay. 
to the corresponding identity. So, uh, since the relative velocities of the interface also satisfy this condition V L minus V I to n must be equal to m dump prime divided by rho l right that is the velocity of the interface think about it it is just that how much of the interface actually moves that is basically what is taken up by the mass flux the amount of mass that is going to the other phase okay and similarly we can write it b v minus v i into n is equal to m dot remember that the, this is liquid density this is the corresponding vapor density right okay so combining all these things together if we write it now pl vl minus vi dot n minus pv vb minus vi dot n come to m double dot minus pv minus sorry minus rho v minus p l divided by rho l ok. That is the expression that is the form that you get ok if you do this kind of substitutions. Now from the relative velocities of the interfaces you get that ok. Now if you to simplify the energy equation that you have over here this guy that you have over here we can make several assumptions because that is a long equation right normally you do not encounter equation as as large as this right. So, how to actually make it uh, appear a little bit simpler. So, there are two ways that you can do it one is that if you neglect the kinetic energy terms are neglected right that is one way of doing it and if you assume that there there are no slip conditions at the interface ok by no slip condition therefore you mean v l t must be equal to v v t it must be equal to v i t right ok across the interface all this velocities should be the same in the tangential direction that is the no slip basically ok. So, the energy equation therefore okay if you apply all these cases okay the uh, that there is no kinetic energy change there is no slip etc etc it becomes a perfectly manageable form which is given by and this i urge you to do the math is just requires the substitution dot n that's it right so it's basically two heat conduction terms that you have right and the corresponding mass transfer due to evaporation or whatever and the corresponding latent heat ok. So, we can arrive at this particular form of this particular equation just by making those assumptions over there ok. So, this is also widely used in fact in most of the cases you will use this right. So, this is the conduction is equal to whatever the mass that is taken away right by this. Okay. Now, you can compare you can make uh, you can have analogies in which you can compare the order of these two terms and you can make assumptions that which gradient to neglect which gradient to take okay, and things like that. Okay. But other than that that is what you are supposed to get. Okay. Now, before we go to the species equation okay, and species equation comes with it a little bit of the uh, how the phase change actually happens. Okay. Let us look at an interesting term over here. So, we will come to uh, this thing a little later, but before that I wanted to cover the because we are still in the momentum part of the equation and momentum and energy we have covered. Let us look at some of the dynamic behaviors of this interfaces because we have done this momentum balance across the interface and things like that. Let us look at the dynamic behavior of the interfaces before we go on to the species balance and then we talk about how evaporation actually happens right, how the slopes matters. Just now we established that there is a two conduction terms basically right that you saw is equal to whatever is the mass that is uh, that actually evaporates right from one phase to the other. 
right if we neglect all the kinetic energy terms and everything okay which is very normal practice to neglect the kinetic energy terms because the other terms are so much more significant right so but before doing that let us do the dynamic uh, part of the interface okay which is what we are going to do in this uh, few slides so so uh, this kind of examples are seen everywhere right say for example you have a vapor right and you have a liquid right okay so basically by vapor and liquid means there is a there is a very uh, large variation in density okay vapor liquid density is almost like 1000 times right so what happens is that there is a layer of liquid which is sitting over a layer of vapor right let us look at the problem in this particular fashion right there is a layer of liquid which is sitting over a layer of vapor and both of these two are actually moving right so uh, so here there is a velocity which is uv which is the vapor phase velocity there is a velocity which is ul okay this average velocity which is in the liquid phase okay and there is an interface which basically separates the two got it okay L let us not talk about evaporation and all those things for the time being okay let us keep this problem very simple now what happens is that a physical state of this interface okay is said to be stable if it can withstand a disturbance and return to its original state okay so if the statement is like that means if this is the interface and i give it a give it a spanking that means i just perturb the interface and i create this perturbation which is delta right so it's basically you can consider it to be like a string right and i am basically just clipping a part of the string string right so it naturally will oscillate now if this oscillation dies down and it returns to its original flat configuration which is this configuration right then we will call that this is a stable situation right so nothing happens you impose a disturbance the disturbance decays away and so it is a stable configuration okay so in this particular case gravity is appearing this way it is a horizontal pipe and you have a liquid and vapor both of which which are actually moving right very common problem okay need not be always liquid vapor it can be disparate density fluids also on the other side of it if we if i just take this and if i just rotate the whole thing okay so what will happen is that gravity is now favoring appearing like this correct and you have a liquid velocity and you have a vapor velocity same thing interface is now vertical instead of horizontal and you, again you perturb it and see how the perturbation actually evolves got it okay so here the parameter that we are interested in can be anything this is phi it can be velocity it can be pressure it can be temperature it can be species also whatever okay and uh, a disturbance of this magnitude which is given by phi prime phi with a prime right that is actually added that means when there is a velocity u we are adding a perturbation which is u prime right so and the interface gets disturbed by this magnitude which is given by delta okay so the both phases we are assuming they are incompressible they are inviscid so that we get rid of all those all those viscous stress terms and it is not that is immiscible that means they don't mix with each other that means there is no diffusion that happens okay in terms of one species going into another right so you can you can think about it uh, in this particular way right Okay. Now, the liquid and the vapor flows are essentially two dimensional in nature that is another set of assumption. Okay. So, based on that what we can do is that we can write three equations this is the mass and the two momentum right. Why the viscous term is not there this is because we have neglected viscosity we have assumed that it is inviscid in nature right. So, what we have you have the u variation of u this is the convective derivative this is basically the inertial term and this is the corresponding pressure we have added gravity in the first case okay that is because of uh, in one case in the y momentum equation gravity enters into the picture so if you look at this particular equation this is the y axis so gravity is acting along the y axis correct okay so that's why the gravity term is uh, is already there right now we are going to uh, decompose the velocity so there are basically three variables right u v and p right so we are going to decompose the velocities and pressures into a base flow 
and some perturbed components, right. So, it is almost like akin to the Reynolds decomposition that we do, okay, in your turbulent flows, right. So, what happens is that you have a u bar which is a mean or what is called the base flow and then there is a perturbation component. V is given by V bar and a perturbation component, P is given by P bar and a perturbation component. So, everywhere there is that perturbation component, right. So, you substitute all of these things over here in this set of equations, right. So, what you get the, the set of equation and you, you recall that your u bar and your v bar and your p bar all satisfied the Navier-Stokes and the mass and, and, the, and the continuity equations, right. Okay. So, based on this substitution you now arrive at three additional sets of equations, right. Okay. So, first one is basically nothing but d u prime d x v prime d y that is the continuity version of the perturbed component. Okay. You can think about it like that. Okay. The next component is this, the next component is that. Now, the products of the perturbation and why the g actually drops down that is because it does not have a perturbation. right? Okay. And we have assumed that the density is of course, fixed. Okay. So, there is no perturbation on the property. right? That can also happen but here we are assuming that the perturbation is not happening on the density and the product of the perturbations that means the prime terms are neglected that is u prime v prime is neglected. Similarly, if there are quantities like u prime p prime these are all neglected. Okay. So, they are all neglected right. Okay. Now, we take this set of equation and we differentiate it with respect to x and y right respectively. Okay, and then we sum them and we substitute the continuity equation. This yields what we call the Laplace equation for the pressure perturbation field. So, if you do this, you will get this particular equation, which is basically nothing but the pressure perturbation, or this is a Laplace. You can, you can see that this is basically this, right. Okay, so, it is the Laplace of the pressure perturbation, okay. it is not the pressure, it is the pressure perturbation. So, that is what we have done over here. So, basically what we have done is that we have basically taken the derivative with respect to x and y okay, and then we have substituted the continuity, we have summed them and we get the Laplace pressure field. Okay. So, th this is the pressure field or the perturbed pressure field that you get right? and the shape of the interface that we showed at any particular point of time is assumed to follow an expression like this. This is very typical linear stability type analysis that people are normally familiar with. right? So, what this has? It has basically a z component that means, the interface fluctuates in the z direction. If you look at it, okay, so that is the interfacial fluctuation and there is a, there is a time component. Okay. So, similarly, the postulated forms of v prime and p prime is also taken as a similar form right like we took in the case of delta okay we took it in the case of delta uh, we have done a very similar thing for v prime and p prime okay these are postulated forms okay we are postulating that this will be the form and then we use the corresponding laplace this is a this is a two dimensional field okay only one curvature is needed right so the p capillary pressure is what we are using over here. Okay. So, based on these postulated forms one can show and this is not a linear stability analysis class. So, we are not going through the detailed math of how we are arriving it arriving at this. Okay. What we get is that an expression like this that means, the square of the velocity difference between the two phases not the perturbed, but the mean velocity square and you have taken a modulus of that. That means, you have taken a minus taken the absolute value of that and squared it. Okay. So, it does not matter which one is positive or negative, right? which one is slow or fast. correct? Okay. So, that is given by this particular expression. Like at, let us look at it term by term. There is a term involving sigma, which is the surface tension. There is a term involving the gravity right? Okay. and this alpha that we have written over here is called the wave number. Okay, it is 2 pi by lambda, lambda is a wavelength, so alpha is a wave number. Now, the surface tension and gravity, so this is surface tension term, this is gravity term, right? that is what we told. So, surface tension and gravity tends to stabilize the interface for this configuration. Okay. So, if you look at the configuration for, the, uh, for, this, for this, this particular configuration, right? 
both gravity as well as surface tension tries to stabilize the interface. That means, it tries to bring the interface back to its original configuration which is flat right. Okay. So, both gravity and this tries to do it. Okay. So, the right side of this and remember this is also an inequality form right. So, this must be greater than that. Okay. So, the right side of this inequality has a minimum value right side means this side has got a minimum value when the wave number is equal to the critical wave number right. So, if you minimize this part the right hand side of this equation right okay, what will happen is that this has a minimum and that minimum okay, that minimum alpha because all other quantities okay, so are, are fixed right. So, only alpha is a variable that you have here. So, basically you minimize this quantity in terms of alpha right. Okay, so, that critical alpha is given by this particular parameter which is nothing but rho L minus rho V that is the difference in density of the two phases right and multiplied by G divided by sigma and the root over of that right. Okay. This sounds familiar to a certain audience you can think about it I will give the answer in the next class that what does this actually resemble right this sigma divided with this you can write it like this rho L minus rho V into g and root over of that okay this is an in interesting quantity okay that is associated with this okay so what is this basically means that it is basically sigma and the corresponding gravity term essentially right okay similarly when you substitute this alpha critical over there okay in the expression you get a critical difference a velocity differential right okay and that is given by this particular expression Okay. For motionless liquid over motionless vapor that means, when the both the phases are actually static right. Okay. So, this was it was it is actually moving right. Now, if the if the vapor and the liquid phases are all motionless in nature then alpha must be greater than alpha critical that means, it must be greater than this particular quantity lambda c that is the critical wavelength okay, is given by this particular expression which is nothing but uh, this particular length scale that we have here and this perturbation a perturbation which has a wavelength greater than this lambda c will actually grow. That means, when you have a motionless liquid sitting over a motionless vapor what will happen is that if you perturb it okay, with, a, with an amplitude okay, which is greater than this particular critical wavelength okay, this will actually grow. Right? So, look at one particular thing a perturbation greater than this wavelength that is the key clause over here right. So, when this rho L and rho V becomes very close to each other right that means, you are dealing with water and something which is a little bit more denser than water right. What will happen in that particular case right this lambda c will be a very large quantity right. So, in order to perturb that particular interface you need an exceedingly high amplitude right because that amplitude space is very large lower than this would not uh, would not do anything right. So, the perturbation needs to have a huge amplitude okay. So, long amplitude okay, uh, or long wavelength essentially right. Similarly on the other hand if this vela if this density difference is huge typically what happens between liquid and vapor right it is a huge density difference right. This quantity is very large right. So, the wavelength space if you look at it. So, previously if this was the critical lambda c right the critical lambda c is pushed back right to the short wavelength regime correct when you actually have a large density differential which is delta rho correct. When it gets pushed over here to this side okay, any wavelength which is greater than this will make the interface unstable. Previously what happened? when the interface was here right when the critical wavelength was here any disturbance in this regions will not be able to create destabilize the interface. On the other hand if the if the uh, density difference is too large okay, essentially what we will have you will have the disturbances okay, for of very short wavelengths also can actually grow right. So, that is a very key takeaway point right even if you do not remember anything if you just remember this okay, this actually shows that if the perturbation for a motionless 
configuration. If the perturbation is greater than this amplitude, it will grow. And you should always remember that surface tension and gravity here tries to stabilize the interface. So, you have to fight against them essentially, right? And that is what exactly what you are doing over here by making your wavelength greater than that, right? So, this particular thing is called, it has got a celebrated name, it is called the Rayleigh Taylor instability, okay? It is called the Rayleigh Taylor instability. So, you can have a recap, we actually have a a uh, flat interface okay, with two fluids moving on both sides, we add a perturbation component uh, to the whole thing, right. We decompose it into two components, uh, I mean in into a mean flow or a base flow and a perturbation part and then if we differentiate the equations and do some math, basically it is just a, just a tool and it is very standard these days, okay. You get a Laplace of the pressure, perturb pressure field and then you assume forms of delta the pressure field and the velocity field and then you add the interfacial conditions which is basically nothing but the capillary pressure, right? And then you can show that what the velocity difference should be, right? Okay, for a uh, flow to get unstable, right? And for motionless uh, con configuration, okay, the perturbation needs to have an amplitude which is greater than the, uh, greater than this, got it? Okay. So, Rayleigh Taylor instability is seen in many cases, okay. not just in one case, it is seen in, in multiple fields. Okay. Now, this is Rayleigh Taylor. Okay. Uh, also, we can define something called, uh, uh, see the, the right hand side, you can also maximize it. right? So, you get a maximum alpha and then you get an lambda d, which is called the most dangerous wavelength, basically the wavelength that grows the fastest, right. So, that is actually root over 3, that is approximately 1.7 of lambda c, okay, of the critical. So, it is about 1.7 times, if you are perturbing it at that amplitude, the uh, perturbations will grow, okay, very rapidly. Now, in this cases, the gravity was, uh, uh, the gravity was opposed, well, it was perpendicular to the flow direction, right. In the case of uh, the, in the case of the other configuration, the vertical flow, you actually have gravity which is, uh, which is in the direction of the flow. In that particular case, you can show this okay, and there it gravity does not have a significant effect on the pressure of the phases. So, there you have this particular expression is satisfied. Okay. So, it is basically U L minus U V square on, the, on this side is only surface tension now which plays a role, right? okay, which opposes. Okay. So, a condition for an unstable interface is therefore, this particular type of interface which is a vertical and gravity is actually in the direction of the flow, it is basically called Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Okay. So, one is a Rayleigh Taylor instability, this is a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, both are very similar, it is just the configuration difference, which way the gravity is pointing, okay. that is what actually leads to this kind of configurations. right? So, you get an idea that when the you have an interface, okay, it is basically the force balance across the interface, not only just the static force balance, right? it is also the dynamic behavior of the interface that is very important. Because when you do heat and mass transfer analysis, especially say you take the configuration when a droplet is a liquid droplet, right? Uh, when it is put into a flow of air, right? what happens? the droplet actually should get perturbed, this is an interface between uh, droplet and, and the liquid and the air, right? Okay. and there is a flow, there is a recirculation inside the droplet, there is a flow outside right? and there is a huge difference in density, this delta rho is large. right? So, naturally you will develop waves on the droplet surface right? and these waves can actually lead to this caged type instabilities, that is in fact what you see in your atomization type of studies that there are surface waves that are created and this actually leads to ultimately leads to uh, break up because when these waves actually grow right they will grow right because that's that most dangerous wavelength right so they will grow and then they can actually break okay so uh, they can actually atomize okay and give rise to small satellite droplets got it okay so this is an important exercise that is because we showed the dynamic nature of the interface now we showed the static nature of the interface okay 
and uh, we covered all the equations the relevant equations that goes with it. Okay. And after so in the next class what we would try to do is that we are going to try to see that how the species balance now can be entered into the picture and we will look at the mass transfer the uh, mass and heat transfer side of things. This we have looked from the force balance point of view that how the so this interfaces actually do not actually evaporate this example that I showed over here. Okay. So, uh, in the next class we will try to do the, uh, the species balance and move from there. Thank you.